think. Unless there's anything else I've missed, anyone can think of? No? Good. Apologies if you suddenly see a dog. <laughs> there's probably <laughs> a cat. <laughs> probably I have actually um, shut Mort out. We can't compete with Mort, so I've shut uh, him out. Um, yeah, <laughs> some of those kind of problems. Oh, oh, cute. <laughs> cute. A very cute dog indeed. But bitey, but bitey. Cool. Okay, well, welcome early birds. This is the first uh, item on stream A of Conspire, the BSFA and Science Fiction Foundation's co-event today. Um, and this is 50 years of the Science Fiction Foundation. Um, I'm your moderator, Maureen Kincaid Speller. Um, pronouns are she, her. <laughs> Um, I'm going to apologise in advance if you hear some very strange noises from here. Um, I have some pigeons who are trying to make baby pigeons. Um, they've gone away for the time being, but they may come back. They're very, very persistent. Um, right, in a moment, I'm going to invite our panellists to introduce themselves <laughs> and explain briefly their connection to the Foundation, after which we'll move on to um, a broader discussion. Uh, first of all, those of you who are expecting to see Edward James, I'm sorry to say that Edward is not well and can't be with us today. However, we're very pleased to welcome in his place Graeme Slight, who is the current chair of the Science Fiction Foundation, and I, I know will be a very, very formidable uh, substitute. So um, best wishes to Edward and uh, get well as soon as you possibly can. Okay, so I'm going to take this in alphabetical order. So that means I'll be asking Roz, Farah, Andy and Graham in that order to introduce themselves and tell us a little about themselves and then about their connection to the foundation. So off you go, Ros. Oh, right. I'm Ros Caveney, pronouns she. Um, I write poetry, I write novels. I these days write most more about film and television than books, but I write quite a lot about books. I used to do a lot of reviewing for Foundation the magazine. It let me find my voice in a very important way. Um, I was notoriously rude and stroppy when I was younger. Um, and Foundation and Vector gave me a, a platform to, to rant about what I thought science fiction and fantasy should be like. And that in turn has caused me to do a lot of thinking about what writing should be like, which has affected my, my own work as well as my critical work. Um, I absolutely love the foundation. I've done research, I've used the library for research on various occasions when it was in London. It's so useful, so life-changing. There you go. Thank you. Farah. You're muted. I'm having problems. Sorry. No, I'm still not there. Am I there? Yeah, now? You're there. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I've got. What I was saying was, I've got a poor connection. I'm going to do my introduction, then I'm going to log out and come back in again. Okay. okay thank you. So I'm Farah Mendelssohn, and I join. Uh, I actually don't like pronouns myself. I'd rather people just used Farah. I joined the Science Fiction Foundation first as a, a typist in the days when we still received quite a lot of submissions just on paper. Or if they did come in via computer, they came in files that we couldn't transfer, so they still had to be typed in. I then became assistant, no, first features editor, because I was quite good at coercing people into write, writing for us. And then assistant editor, because I was really good at writing rejection letters, which Edward hated doing. Um, and eventually, when he went to the States for a few years on a sabbatical, I actually took over as editor. And I think at some point before that, I'd already become chair. Uh, my memory is around about 2000, 2001, but I may have that wrong. And although technically I'm not a trustee anymore, I've stayed as, as part of the Science Fiction Foundation group ever since. Thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to leave you and I'll jo re join you very shortly. Okay. Andy. Hi. Uh, yes, I'm Andy Sawyer. Uh, and I'd, I'd like to sort of apologize uh, in advance for the fact that I am only here for this thing, but I do have a, did have a long-standing family engagement for today, which is going to take me away from 
all the uh, excitements that everybody else is going to um, uh, be involved in. But uh, yes, I I um, I started subscribing to Foundation in the mid seventies and wrote letters um, to uh, uh, Peter Nichols and which some of which were published and uh, eventually started reviewing for Foundation and um, became librarian administrator of the uh, Science Fiction Foundation collection when it moved to Liverpool in uh, 1993. Um, I'm retired now. I retired in, oh God, when did I retire? 2018, I think it was. Um, uh, I am still scribbling um, and that's, I guess, enough about me for the moment. Graham. Um, hi, I'm Graham Slight. I am, I guess, the Stephen Moffat for the day, in the sense <laughs> that I inherited a, a, uh, a the institution um, a couple of years before its 50th anniversary and feel it's my job to custodian it um, through the 50th anniversary. Um, and we seem to have engineered a, a, a reunion of some of the the past faces of the institution, which is which which is marvelous. Um, I think it was Farah who first um, enticed me into this. Um, first as a member of the committee, um, then as a journal editor, and now as chair of the SF Foundation. Um, and that's as far as the Stephen Moffat parallels go. I assure you. I'm very glad to hear that. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on, if anybody wants to ask questions, please do type them into the chat box and uh, Ali and I will wrangle them later and uh, put them to our panellists. Also, pleased to note, we've got quite a lot of long time uh, foundation habituates in the audience, which is um, no pressure there for any of us. Um, first question uh, for those who have been around a long time, which appears to be quite a lot of us actually, um, how did the foundation come into being, if you can remember that? What, what, what do you remember about its inception? I don't know whether this one might be for you to start with, Ross. I, I, was, I wasn't around. You just went there, no. Yes, that, that's, I mean, the person who knows more about that than me is actually in the audience, which would be Malcolm uh, Edwards, um, who was certainly one of the first uh, librarians of the foundation. Um, I have absolutely no idea what was going on <laughs> or be, be, before I started writing for the magazine. Sorry. Right. That's okay. It's useful to find these. Um, Graham. Well, I, I've, I've done what every right thinking person should do in this circumstance. So I admit I, I should declare an interest because I, I, I'm involved in the enterprise. But I've just looked the SFF up on the SF encyclopedia and it says what I'd sort of half remembered. Uh, UK research units set up in 1971 at the North East London Polytechnic, but semi-autonomous, being controlled by a council, partly academic and partly SF professionals, and including George Hay, whose enthusiasm had much to do with the SFF's inception. Peter Nichols, the first administrator in 1971 to 77, was followed by Malcolm Edwards, 1978 to 80. Um, and so I guess that's it in a, in a uh, thumbnail. I suppose I'd say we, you know, we are constituted as a UK charity. I think we always have been, or certainly have been for, for as far back as our records go. And um, we obviously no longer associated with the North East London Polytechnic, um, having our, our library at Liverpool. And um, yeah, we, we, I think, would now view ourselves as autonomous full stop, but having mm -hmm. strong ties to a number of institutions, including Liverpool and for instance, the Clark Award also. Yes, and the one thing I was hoping to push a little bit, but I think probably we don't actually have the people here who can do this, is to talk a, a tiny bit about what seemed to me to be a sort of, not exactly a clash of ideologies, but um, something that seems to have become a familiar theme since, you know, what is the foundation for? It was quite clear that right at the beginning there was a, an academic perception of it, and then there was George Hay's perception of it. And um, for those 
who don't remember George Hayes, probably way before most people's time. He was a great ideas man. He really was. It was firing them off left, right and centre um, and sort of chucking them into the ether to see what came back. And I think quite often he was a little taken aback by what happened or you know, what came back to him. And uh, there's an article in Foundation uh, in 1974, uh, looks like the January one. So what for the record the science fiction ought to be about? And it's quite clear, not least because he's sort of quoting, favorably quoting Ayn Rand, that he had a very, very different vision of the foundation. I'm not so sure it's, uh, um, you know, sort of actually coincides with what seems to me um, to have been a much, most people had a perception of it as a much more academic kind of enterprise. Um, Andy, from your perception, would you think that would be the case? Sorry, yes, pretty much so. Um, I um, <clears throat> I remember looking at some um, very early minutes of the um, uh, Foundation Committee and um, or Council or whatever it was they called themselves in in those days, and um, even in the in the in the early days, it was. Uh, um, a sort of question of uh, whether it was about improving uh, and developing the uh, academic reception to science fiction, which I think was very much what Peter Nichols was about, um, or whether it was creating this ideas bank um, for survival after the nuclear apocalypse, when uh, so, no, because there was this uh, run of amazing stories stored somewhere, um, uh, the survivors would be able to, reading science fiction stories about post-apocalypse, be able to uh, deal with the impending uh, uh, doom and catastrophe that was uh, 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 coming about. And um, so, yeah, there was this, a sort of mixture uh, of things. George was um, uh, an interesting, interesting character. He, he, I, I didn't know him terribly well, but he, he, he did have this habit of uh, um, phoning me up and saying, I've just spoken to someone who's really good to tap for money. And when, it, when you sort of investigate it, it sort of turns out he probably met somebody at a party and uh, um, uh, who just kind of nodded at him in an attempt to stop him from talking about science fiction. Uh, but he was genuinely, I think, uh, 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 an interesting um ideas man yeah so my impression is very much he was very passionate about his uh his ideas but um the problem was then they're trying to actually get the idea go i mean in many ways i guess one could argue that if he was one of the progenitors of the science fiction it was an idea that flew but not necessarily in a direction that he expected um academically speaking at the time um can anybody sort of speak to what the situation was like? You know, was science fiction being taught anywhere else? Farah and then Andy? Okay, so the main locus of science fiction teaching, I believe, was the city lit in London. And it's possible Paul will discuss that with John Clute when they are talking later today. There wasn't very much going on anywhere else. There were odd individual modules at different universities because by the 1980s, quite a lot of universities were switching over to modular teaching, which at that time allowed you to teach far many more courses than you used to be able to. It's kind of gone the other way now. But it was very clear back in the late 1970s and early 1980s that unless we made it, there would be no outlet for British academics. It was expensive to go to the States to conferences, if you wanted to send an article to an American journal, you had to type it up on paper, send it in an envelope and hope that you might receive it back and get your copy back. There was no guarantee. So a lot of what the academic side of the Science Fiction Foundation was about in its early years was very much about creating space. And I'm using my term carefully here for a scholarly conversation about science fiction, because the journal was never intended to be solely academic for the simple reason there weren't that many academics. I mean, it all explodes a bit by the time I'm in my late 30s. But when I was in my 20s, I could have named 
every single UK academic with an interest in science fiction, and I couldn't have filled a room. Um, I mean, we were talking very small group of people. So the approach that had to be taken was that we were hosting and supporting scholarship rather than supporting academia. And I think that helped make, this, make the foundation of the Science Fiction Foundation rather distinct from anything going on in the States. Indeed. Andy, do you want to add to that? Yes, um, I, I think that's pretty much uh, uh, a thorough uh, point about um, scholarship rather than academia. That uh, um, a lot of uh, a lot of scholarship was coming from fandom. A lot of uh, um, uh, uh, the scholarly journals, as we saw them, things like Science Fiction Horizons, which is essentially Brian Aldiss and uh, uh, Harry Harrison, which lasted for two issues. Um, so the foundation was very much mixed up with that um, interplay between the uh, the scholarly end of fandom and the um, few academics from all sorts of disciplines that who, who were interested in in science fiction. And one name that comes to mind actually that I should have mentioned uh, earlier was Ellis Hillman. I didn't know Ellis Hillman very oh, well, yes. um, but um, he was another of these. Um, uh, ideas man. He was responsible for bringing the uh, archive of the Flat Earth Society into the uh, Science Fiction Foundation uh, because nobody else wanted it essentially. Um, but he was another interesting character and I think it's the, the in a way it was the position of the polytechnics uh, at that era. Um, uh, I, I think we kind of forget that um, places like North, North East London Polytechnic has as it then was, I think. Um, uh, there was this kind of excitement that was uh, going on in, in, in some ways about different ways of looking at it, different ways of, uh, uh, of scholarship. And uh, um, so when the idea of a science fiction foundation uh, came up, I know whether it was George or, or Ellis or somebody else who, who actually physically approached them, um, it was welcomed with a, wow, this is a great idea, let's do this. Thank you. Ros, what was it actually like to go and read at the Foundation Library? Well, it was, it was, it was like any other library except it was science fiction and science fiction magazines. I mean, you know, it was well curated, you could find the things you wanted, it was just it was a it was a good and professional library, which was what one wasn't used to in science fiction in those days. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in a sense, as someone who'd spent some of the previous years working in the Br British British Library's manuscript room, it was or, or before that the Bodleian. It was just a proper library. That was the crucial thing about it. Yes. <laughs> I would actually say, though, that it was, I hate to say this, in some ways it was a lot more enjoyable than the modern library. It was a big, airy room and 90% of the stock was open access. Yeah. Now, you couldn't do that now because, first of all, most, much of the material was perishable. Uh, the magazines in particular were in quite poor condition when they first transferred to Liverpool. And the library is much, much bigger. Um, so, I mean, I'm just trying to think, so that I only went down there a couple of times, in fact, that's where I first met Ros, uh, mm. but the room was kind of like a big classroom with desks and bookcases all around the edges and not that many freestanding rooms, and it was a really just a rather pleasant place, but it was much more like a domestic library. It was much more like, say, the, the room we have upstairs than it was a space like the British Library or the Modern Science Fiction Foundation Library, where you've got stacks, where you need permission to look at things. I mean, I've always been very privileged. I've always been allowed to go into the stacks, but I don't know if that's true of everybody. Um, so it, it was essentially a lot more amateur than it is now. Mm. I only went and once I think far less of an archive as well. Yes, more I than only library, once... less of an archive. Mm. I only went once, but that's very much my memory of it. Um, I mean, I visited Liverpool a number of times, obviously, and uh, it was uh, it was, you know, as you say, it was very much like being in somebody's really big collection in their house, and very very nice as a 
you know, it felt extraordinarily welcoming, which when you thought about how a lot of people felt about science fiction as a scholarly enterprise, this was kind of very reassuring. Um, Graham, sorry, I've been overlooking you. Not at all. I mean, I was going to attempt an answer to, to your question of a few minutes ago about what is the SFF for? Mm. And I, I suppose I'd frame it as who is the SFF for? And it seems to me both that now and in the past that everyone has been describing, the most interesting thing about it, the most important thing about it, is that it stands at crossroads of a bunch of different things. Mm -hmm. It stands at the crossroads of, as, as, as people have said, the growing academic formal study of SFF, um, of, uh, let's say, the really scholarly um, fan end of things. And it's incredibly important that both it provided a space for us to write, write stuff and that it you know, provides the, the space for, I hope, similar people in the, in the Fanish world now to be able to, to write stuff. And also to an extent still, and, and we hope George Hay was looking down on us and smiling, for the intersection of science fiction with science. And it's important to us that we host the Hay Lecture every year at EasterCon and that we, for instance, in the Science for Fiction courses that Dave Clements hosts, um, think about where science fiction crosses over with science. So it, it, it feels to me that it sits, I hope it sits, at the intersection of at least those three traditions, maybe more, and that it is welcoming to anyone from any of those fields who wants to come and um, make use of us in whatever sense we can be made use of. Absolutely, and I'd actually like to come back a little later on to what um, the foundation has done, um, you know, as uh, apart from the library and uh, the publication of the journal, probably actually would be a good moment to sort of stop and think a little about the journal. Um, I currently famously work behind the scenes, um, copy editing and occasionally turning over two pages and missing the corrections. Um, but uh, I think one could say that the foundation as a journal has been going for a remarkably long time now. I, I was looking back at the very, very early um, issues of it and the, yes, the original vision of it. And as Farah said, um, it was originally going to publish um, fiction, scholarly articles, all sorts of things. And this very quickly um, narrowed down. Um, in fact, I don't think the sort of fiction element or fiction and poetry element of it ever really got off the ground. It almost immediately became something that uh, they realized they couldn't handle, but it's, as a thing, it seems to sort of, the vision was there right from the beginning and um, it's pushed on and sort of gone off in unexpected ways from time to time, but it's been very clear in its mission, I think, almost from the beginning. Graham, are you waving a pencil or just I, waving I, a pencil? I, I am, that's my, my um, I, I'm, in my spare time, I'm a school governor, so I've got back in the hand of putting my hand up when I want to say something. <laughs> no, it's extremely um, helpful well, to me, actually, on, thank on, you. On the fiction point, I just note that Farah and I jointly edited Foundation 100 as a fiction issue, and, you know, it's great mm -hmm. to see so it comes the back. stories get, get yeah. reprinted in years best. But the you're absolutely right. The variousness of early um, issues of Foundation was really striking. I, I, I now can't remember the year, and someone may be able to look it up, but when Tom Baker stood down as Doctor Who, Foundation published an article by Alexei Sale on why there should be a Marxist like him in the TARDIS. So, you know, um, that's oh. a little outside the... The, the academic norm, I think. Yes, but I, I think it speaks to the idea that the foundation as an entity, um, as well as foundation as a journal, is um, a much broader enterprise than I think a lot of people realise. Um, I think everybody on this panel and myself, we've all actually contributed to foundation as writers, as well as um, at least several of us editing and contributing to bits of it. Which um, it's surprising to me, actually, looking back, how many people have been involved with Foundation the Journal over the years. It's, uh, um, you know, whenever you flip through, there's a lot of names that are recognisable even now, which I, I think, again, makes it a, an interesting, um, it's that bit different, I think, to some of the other academic journals. Um, and a very strong emphasis, I feel, too, on independent scholarship. Oh, absolutely. Um, I've been quite passionate about that almost from the beginning, partially because it's where we got our interdisciplinarity from. Um, some, I think Paul mentions below that we've got an astronomer writing on down there. So 
one of the things, one of the mistakes I think is sometimes made is thinking of independent scholars as amateurs. They aren't amateurs, they're just not attached to either a university or to what we might, somebody might think of as the right department of a university. But I hit quite a lot of issues when I was much, much younger because I was a historian. And certain sections of our field didn't seem to feel that they needed anybody but literary scholars in the field. And I think foundation has really offered something a bit different in those terms and essentially saying there are many different ways to approach science fiction, all of them are valuable. And one of the most important is simply archive work. We are one of the few journals that have regularly published archive research, things about publishing history, um, things about paper. I, I know that Bridget Wilkinson mentions that we fundraise to, for asset-free boxes for the magazines. Well, one reason why we could do that rel relatively easily is because our followers, our supporters, are actually quite passionate about the early history of science fiction in a way that you won't necessarily find attached to the other journals. You find very little work on it, in fact. So I think there's an intersection between that determination to remain open to scholars of many experiences and the kinds of material we publish and why we're more than just a journal, we're a foundation with an archive as well. So I think mm -hmm. it's really quite important that that, that happens. Uh, I mean, it's one of the things we've had to do is we envision ourselves every so often. And one of the big shifts, I think, is that many younger scholars come into science fiction via fandom. So some of the things that made foundation distinct are now appearing in the other journals simply because it's a background that the academics bring with them. But that, that's relatively recent. Up until about a decade ago, I would have said that that fanish aspect, that interest in the wider field of science fiction was very much us. I mean, actually, there was one point where I flat out, I, I got into trouble for this, I flat out refused to take any more articles on the Gwyn and, and Philip K. Dick. Not because I'm particularly opposed to scholarship on Dick and the Gwyn, but because that was all anybody was publishing in any of the journals. It, academia had gotten so narrow. It had got to the point that I could predict what would be on people's science fiction courses. I knew what articles would say. It was ridiculous. And at that point, Foundation was really much more open and much more varied. I, I don't think that's as true anymore in the sense that I think that the other journals have all become rather more flexible. Mm -hmm. Yes, I confess Paul March Russell and I occasionally have conversations about, do we need another Philip K. Dick article soon? Probably <laughs> not. Um, oh, okay, we need- Can I just say, <laughs> Maureen, can I just say, particularly when they start, no one has ever written on dot, dot, dot. <sighs> yes. Words that chill the heart of any editor. Um, but well, we nearly well, lost all. Sorry, Roz, do carry on. I just wanted to, 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 to pop in and say one of the beating hearts of Foundation, certainly of Farah's era, but ongoingly, was the, the fact it actually gave writers the profession of science fiction pieces. Those, those always struck me as one of the beating hearts of what it was for that people actually got to define their own interests and their own preoccupations so that subsequent scholarship could, had actually somewhere to, to grip, grip on, take a grip on. Mm. I think and some of those pieces have become very valuable. They've been reprinted. Um, Narlow's Professional Science Fiction has gone into a reprint edition. Um, I know Diana Wynne Jones has ended up on a, a web uh, on her own website and is quoted endlessly. So I, I think Ross's point that it gave material to, to critics is extremely valuable. And it, I mean, this sounds minor, but when Edward and I we were editing in our various periods, the whole concept of the death of the author was terribly popular. And whilst the initial concept of that is very specific and I don't have a problem with it, it was taken to extremes and Edward and I basically came out against that and the professions of the profession of science fiction was in part a way of giving authors a chance to say no not dead you may disagree you may have a different interpretation of my work but that doesn't mean I'm dead 
<laughs> so I think it was very much part of that conversation. If people think I'm joking, um, at one of the Science Future Foundation conferences, somebody gave a paper on Ian M. Banks in which they described him as a technophobe and then talked about imagining him working in his thatched cottage of the Highlands. We're allowed to pause so that everybody can giggle at that. But they, they genuinely had no idea about any of Ian Banks's ideas. I have a feeling yeah. I was actually in that panel. Um, I, I think you were sitting on the end of it and may have seen Cam McLeod stick his head on the table. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm fairly sure I was in the audience for that because that rings a bell. Um, yes. Which actually brings us to another um, aspect of the foundation. Uh, I don't, um, I mean, first of all, I think historically we need to take that point where the um, foundation um, was no longer welcome at uh, the poly because they had got a very, they changed their uh, ideas about what they wanted to do. And we were, uh, because I say we, but I think we will feel invested in this. Um, we were in imminent danger of becoming homeless and needing somewhere to go. And it was this point that Friends of Foundation, I think came into being uh, as a way of helping, you know, supporting the foundation itself, the, the library and the entity as, um, it tried to find a new home. Um, Friends of Foundation, I think, was an extraordinary thing because it was that point you began to see just how much fans cared about the foundation. Um, and the support was astonishing. Um, I mean, I remember running around a convention waving flyers at everybody, and stuffing things into their hands and everybody was, yes, absolutely, we must do this. And of course, we ended up at um, Liverpool who have been very, very gracious hosts to us. Um, they pointed, uh, Andy Sawyer, our very own Andy, as a librarian. And I think in many respects, sort of, if we had a first golden age in the early years at the Poly, we had a second golden age um, at the, when we arrived at Liverpool, because you know, we were talking about publications. We started to um, uh, publish material. And we also had an extraordinary string of conferences, which uh, I think was probably the first time I personally saw academics and fans and authors all participating together, discussing science fiction. And it had a profound effect on me, and I hope it had a profound effect on other people as well, you know, to show us what could do, we could do. Andy? Yeah, I just, <coughs> um, coming in on that, I just wanted to say uh, um, not so much about, about my um, uh, regnum, but the, the, the interregnum, I think was a sort of particularly interesting uh, point when there was essentially no administrator. Um, it was run by um, someone who's hadn't been mentioned so far, but very much ought to be, Joyce Day, who um, was essentially a part-time secretary. Uh, and the person who taught me um, librarianship cla classification, who, this is another story, um, developed a classification scheme for the Science Fiction Foundation, described her to me as the finest natural librarian he ever knew. Um, if, it wasn't for, if it wasn't for Joyce, and then later on the Friends of Foundation who came along and provided that sort of um, physical and moral support, the whole thing would have collapsed long, long before it, it came to Liverpool. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I think those of us who met Joyce, she's delightful. She was so welcoming, so friendly, never remotely exasperated when we were all standing around her sort of talking 19 to the dozen because here we all were in the middle of a library, but gosh, we were all science fiction people too. Uh, we had so much to say to each other. Uh, she was absolutely fantastic. It was always lovely to see her at the Clark Award as well. And she came, I think two or three times. And uh, she is one of the great unsung heroes of this entire story. Um, this should be remembered. Um, so we have publication, um, we have the conferences, we now have the library fully settled in um, Liverpool. Um, we have an, a new librarian, which is Phoenix Alexander, um, he's doing a great job, cooking up a storm on Twitter and things like that as well, so we're, we're very, very visible. How do we see the foundation as an entity uh, going forward. Anybody like to speak to that? I am. 
Go well, on, Greg. As, as with your introduction, Maureen, no pressure at all. Um, <laughs> I mean, I think the first thing to say is this is a collective enterprise. And, you know, it's, it's not just for me to, 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 to say that. Um, and secondly, of course, right now, you know, for us, as for many organisations, the main challenge is dealing with this utterly extraordinary COVID period we're in. And obviously, we hope it's all clearing. But, you know, it's been a real regret that, for instance, we haven't been able to run one of our criticism masterclasses in the last 18 months. Um, and we want to pick that up. I think the big opportunity for us is terrible buzzword, but it's around digital. It's around the fact that technologies like the one we're using right now give us the chance to have much more reach for what we do and, you know, also have opportunities to preserve things more easily. And so, you know, almost without us noticing it, this panel is being recorded. Um, presumably it can sit in, a, in an archive forever if, if, if we want it to. And the opportunity of making all the outreach stuff we do available more widely, more permanently, um, seems to me the, the really, really big one. And clearly the sorts of things you do have to shape themselves around what this medium is good at and what this medium is bad at. Thank you. Uh, would anybody else like to speak to that? You're muted again. I'm muted myself. I, that's because I've got a dog with me and I don't want to disturb everybody. Sorry about that. She's very cute, but she bite, she's bitey. Um, I want to come in there, but I do want to emphasize here, I am not talking as a member of the committee. I'm not on the committee. I'm just talking now as somebody who's observing the current scene. Universities are in big trouble and journals are in big trouble. And these are two quite separate points. Well, they're not totally separate. I think we're relatively secure at Liverpool. They are very pleased with, with us. They wouldn't have appointed Phoenix Alexander, waves to Phoenix who is in the chat room, um, if they weren't happy to go forward with the Science Fiction Foundation. So that aspect of it is fine. But in the past six months, we've seen redundancies uh, announced at several universities some of them considered quite high ranking successful universities. So one of the things I don't think people necessarily understand is that Brexit and COVID have hit the richer universities harder because they're the ones who had the overseas students and the overseas grants. So the very places that you would think were secure are now actually under threat. And we have a government that actively wants universities to go under, which is quite anti the arts. I mean, it said these things, I'm not saying things, I'm not making this up. And we're seeing a retrenchment of courses offered. So there is a worry that the teaching of science fiction is about to start disappearing from the academy, particularly at well, particularly graduate level actually, because NAs are under threat by lack of funding for both the teacher and the students. And alongside that, there is a long running problem that Maureen, you probably know just as much about which is that in the 1990s and 2000s, a lot of academic journals were taken over by Elsevier and Taylor and Francis and a, a couple of others, but those are the two biggest. And they basically came along as Greeks offering gifts. If you <laughs> sign up with us, we will do all your distribution for it, or you, your layout, et cetera, et cetera. We will make this terribly, terribly easy. And I do not know why Edward and I thought it was too good to be true, but Edward and I, and then Graham, all thought it was too good to be true, and foundations stayed independent. And it may have been the best long-term decision we ever took. In that, yes. on the one hand, it's, yeah, it slowed us down. You know, we, we aren't as digitally savvy as some of the other journals. We don't necessarily look as pretty, but we're miles cheaper. We aren't caught up in the problem that universities have, where Elsevier says, you cannot buy this individual journal, you can only buy this bundle. And they have to decide, can they afford the bundle? No, no, you can just buy us. It's easy, okay? So on the one hand, I can see the Science Fiction Foundation having to rethink its offering because many of the people most active with us 
are academic scholars who did not find places in academia, but work in a librarianship, in publishing, in all sorts of different areas while carrying on with their work, and we will want to support them, and we're in a good position to do that. And on the other hand, if we can sort out our digital side and get our marketing active, we remain one of the cheapest, most easily accessible journals in the field, and that can only be good for us. Absolutely. So I think having gone through a period where in some ways we've been a bit overtaken because we didn't do certain things, it's actually going to save our bacon that we did. Mm -hmm. Ros and Andy, do you, either of you, wish to with Ros? Oh, yes. Um, well, one of the problems with this government and with the elite class generally is this kind of, at the one hand, on the one, simultaneously, they think that the mission of this country is to move money around rather than actually create anything. Now, this is wrong-headed in all sorts of ways, not least of which is that the creative industries in this country are one of its major sources of income. And this government has this idiotic dislike of creativity because of most creative people have politics that are not the politics of this government. This is coupled with a very stuffy, oh, all of this stuff is terribly postmodern and icky and, 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 and woke. And we, we, what we need is pro academia that does proper stuff like, well, not even great because they don't actually like cl proper classical scholarship. Their idea of what classical scholarship ought to be, which is Boris Johnson rec reciting Greek tags inaccurately. We're on the one hand placed as quite cutting edge because we operate at the inter interface of a number of fields uh, that science fiction and fantasy are an important part of the media landscape of industries like gaming. It would be very, it would have been very easy of us for us at one point to have tried to be a, a little branch of posh literature. Um, slight sidetrack, back when in, at the beginning of the 80s, I wrote my big su su survey of science fiction in the 70s, I was fairly broad church about what I thought was good. And a writer who shall be nameless actually rang me up and delivered a vast remonstrance about how I was a symptom of everything that was going wrong with the field because of my tolerance of fantasy and space opera. And he, and he, or it was he, said, I predict that if you go on down this path, one day you'll be writing about films. One day you'll be writing about television. One day you'll be writing about comic books. And I privately thought to myself, sounds like a plan. But there was that attitude, and it's something we have to be aware of because there is a version of science fiction scholarship which could fit into a traditional academic landscape that may try and claw back space from, uh, uh, because that's the sort of academia that this government will find appealing. And we need to be aware that we're, we're, we're potentially up against it. Right, um, we're very nearly at the end. There is a question in the chat that I'd like to come back to. Just finish up with a sort of little bit of um, academic sort of thought from us here. Um, Sarah Brown, hi Sarah, uh, said just responded to the dis discussion about Philip K. Dick. Are there writers topics within SF that don't get the attention they deserve, do you think? Quick answer in turn. Um, Ros, Farah, Andy, Graham. What do you think, Ros? I think, you know, there was a, a point where there was a tendency to concentrate on a few people who commodified in traditional, um, import, you know, great author, great author terms. Um, mm -hmm. It led to an over-concentration on Philip Dick. It led to an over-concentration, wonderful writer those years, on Le Guin. Yeah. There's a slight tendency to sacralise particular writers at the expense of everything else. And that 
is being resisted and has to be resisted. Ara. Oh, I know I have, this is my hobby horse. <laughs> Small hobby horse. <laughs> period between 19, big hobby horse, I'm afraid, because one of these days I will write this damn book. Crazy. The period Crazy. between 1929 and 1945 is is extremely neglected mm -hmm. and one of the problems with that is that can the current discussion about the past of science fiction proceeds from the understanding that boring right-wing white men like campbell were the beginning of american science fiction whereas exact in fact quite radical left-wing men and left-wing women were the people who got involved in those early magazines. Mm -hmm. And there's all sorts of problems with them. There's issues of racism and progressive, et cetera. But the early history of magazine science fiction actually has far more in common with modern thoughts about science fiction than it often does with the so-called golden age. And mm -hmm. there's relatively little work, although there is new work starting to emerge. And, mm -hmm. and Mike Ashley's book is fine if you read those magazines, but if you didn't read those magazines, my cash this book is impenetrable. Say anything. Um, Andy. Um, yeah, uh, uh, yes, that, that, that particular period um, uh, uh, is important, but uh, I, um, I would kind of add a little bit to that, in that, that that particular period is also very, very important outside the magazines, particularly in, 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 the, uh, in the British field. Um, I, I, I tend to, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a weird way, I've been kind of going backwards and backwards um, in, my, in my own work. And I'm kind of at the moment concentrating on the early 19th century. And then something happened the other day, which uh, made me think, oh yeah, maybe I ought to look in the mid 17th century. Um, yeah, so th 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 there's, there's actually a tremendous amount, you know, where do you start, I suppose, is the, uh, uh, is the uh, um, is the response? I mean, at the moment, I'm trying to persuade uh, uh, a, a publisher that Andre Norton is a really good person to have on a um, uh, a key writers in science fiction list. Um, so, kind of, yeah, I won't be writing it, but I'd I'd, I'd love somebody to 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 write it. Indeed. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, I think. Um, there's a there's a whole a whole range of of writers who I would say most of us um, think as um, key writers in our uh, personal experience. Who, if you mention to um, uh, uh, people reading science fiction today, would just elicit blank looks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Graham, so where do you yeah, start? sorry, Andy. Yeah, Graham. Um, so I'm going to make some big sweeping generalizations, which of course are, are going to be recorded for posterity. I think one of the things, one of the tendencies, maybe, um, that some people come out of academia with is it equips you particularly with the tools to do thematic criticism. And it may be that that's one of the reasons people gravitate to Le Guin and Philip Dick, and also, though Farah didn't mention, certainly in my experience, endless articles on the Matrix, oh. because thematic criticism is particularly easy to do on them. I would, I would be really interested in work on SF authors who are interesting for their use of, let's say, formal structures. Um, and so to take two writers with a, a clear connection, um, John M. Ford and Joe Walton. I mean, there's a bit out there on Walton, but I think not nearly enough. Um, looking at formal structures that SF writers use, it seems to me a big, relatively uncultivated um, field. Mm -hmm. Right, ladies and gentlemen. Can I just chime in to, to mention, to, to just mention two writers who do work on that? If people are interested, take a look at Peter Stockwell and Susan Mandela who've both done some really interesting linguistics formalist work. And mm -hmm. I'm hoping to do exactly that with Joanna Ross. Okay, if Brilliant. you could put a note on that in the chat, that would be very helpful. Because um, the transcripts, uh, transcription is uh, mangling names. 
Right, regrettably, everybody, I am going to have to bring this to a close. It's been a wonderful panel. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. I hope you all have. I'd like to thank Ros Caveney, Farah Mendelssohn, Andy Sawyer and Graham Slight uh, for being our panellists. And again, send our best wishes to Edward James, who wasn't able to be with us. Um, I'd like to thank Ali Baker for being a fantastic facilitator. Thank you very much. And I'd also like to thank the BSFA and the Science Fiction Foundation for creating this fantastic event, which I'm very much looking forward to the rest of now. Um, all that remains is to say thank you. I look forward to the next item, which I believe is Paul March Russell interviewing John Clute. So thank you, everybody.